everyone. This is Danielle Stedman, and I'm the host of Dogman Diaries. I'd like to thank you all for joining me tonight, and I'd like to introduce everyone to my guest, Sharon Russell. Sharon, are you there? How are you? Hello, Danielle. Hi. So, Good, thank you. Oh, you. I'm so glad you're here tonight. You have such an interesting, frightening captivating story. I know the listeners are going to love this story. And everyone, this story is a bit hard for Sharon to tell, so we're going to let her take her time and just kind of bear with her. This will be the first time that she has ever publicly told her story, and it is quite frightening. So Sharon, I'm just going to let you, first of all, tell everyone a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and just give us a little bit of background information on you. Okay, my name is Sharon Russell. I'm 54 years old and I have been a lifelong medium and artist all my life. Um, I've had also lifelong UFO contact um, with lots of phenomena. Um, I live in a con in country setting in on the borders sorry, of um, Chelmsford, Essex in the UK. I live with my son and three dogs, three budgies and a garden full of wild birds that absolutely adore me because I feed them all. <laughs> um, I've had numerous um, unusual survival accounts throughout my life, um, but this has to be the ultimate terror of all uh, and the hardest one ever that I've been able to talk about, which is only just in the last 11 days. Um, I've had three near-death experiences. Um, yeah, that's very short version of my life at the moment. Well, Sharon, you have definitely had a very interesting life, and I know we've been talking quite a bit. Uh, I think the first time we talked was last night, and we wound up talking for three or four hours. <laughs> right, but, yeah, there's so much uh, to tell. Yes, I, I mean... probably only told you a quarter of my life, you know, because... But you shared... has been... Unusual and interesting, but very hard as well. Very hard. Yes, but I'm, I'm so grateful that you shared so much with me. And as you know, we've been talking even through email now for over a week. And I consider you one of my yeah. very good friends now. Um, yeah. But you have definitely had a very interesting life, even though you've had... You have had quite a bit of hardship, but you have come out, and you are just wonderful and so brave and so courageous and so strong, and I want to applaud you for that because I know things that the viewers don't or the listeners don't know, and they're not going to know, <laughs> but I mean, it, it really is. It's just amazing that you've been through so much and that, you know, you're willing to share this one little bit of your life with all of us because this is, as you said, the hardest thing for you to confront. And I just want to thank you and tell you, you are so brave and so courageous. And the listeners, when they hear your story, they're going to understand why I'm saying that. But yeah, just know that, you know, we're all with you and, you know, you know, I'm I'm here for you anytime you need me and once the listeners hear your story I promise you they are going to give you their most support I, I can guarantee that well thank you I appreciate that it's like coming together with a family that's you know I mean like I said to you before I've never known anybody else that has ever talked to me about this this, this circumstance but it's just I, I didn't realize just how many people were going through this and I'm glad that I am now talking. But doing the research the last 10, 11 days, and just, I just couldn't believe it. And I then just found out as well there's lots happening in the UK, which I didn't even know that. So I didn't want to know um, because I have this fear talking about it, yeah, that uh, it may return or, or something. That's just paranoia, I, I believe. But, so, yeah, it definitely a terrifying experience for any anybody to go through and I wouldn't want anyone to go. I couldn't wish that on it, you know, my worst enemy. Right. Well, I know you said you've only been, you know, researching this for 11 days. And what brought you to the conclusion that it was now time for you to face this, Sharon? I know you had spoke with Vic Cundiff, well, which we all know and yeah, love Vic. Yeah, that's quite odd how that happened. I was talking to a friend on the other side of the country here um, in Lowestoft, a 
very good friend of mine and we discuss things and we help each other. Um, you know, and we give each other advice, advice sometimes. And he advised me, there's only one more fear that you should tackle and it would be the dog man. You should do something about it. He said, you've faced everything else for your life. Why don't you do this? And I, I told him, just far too petrified to even say the word werewolf. I can say it now, but I don't like that, that word at all. I just, it, it's, I feel a rumble in me even with just the word. Um, but he encouraged me, and he gave me the site to Vic Cundiff, which is a friend of yours. And, you know, I had a chat with Vic last week, and he was so helpful, bless him. He's an absolute diamond, and, you know, I hope he goes on to help so many others like that, because he convinced me it was the right thing to open up, and, you know, it just reassured me that I was doing the right thing. So I had one in this country of a friend, and Vic saying that, and I just, okay, I just took the bull by the horns as such, and said, right, let's go for it. And I, I, I was and have been very scared, because I know every time I talk about it, every time I think about it, I have severe nightmares where there are lots of them coming after me, different scenes. But, um, yeah, it's absolutely awful with the nightmares. Of, I mean, I'm 54. This happened when I was 14. So it's been a hell of a lot of years I've had to live with it. And uh, even just, you know, through the years, I've actually tried watching the films just to face that fear. And I've succeeded in some things because they don't look like what I saw. You get resemblances, but because I, they didn't look like the real thing that I, that I saw, I, I could cope with it better. Although I went on to have nightmares, but, and then I just said one day, I've got to stop doing this. I can't, I can't face it. Yeah, so it, this is a, it is a big tackle for me. I'm nervous now just because I'm getting my words a little bit fuddled up. <laughs> well, I'm, you're I'm, doing wonderful. I'm nervous about just, you know, when, every time I talk about it. it well, just, I mean, we, we discussed it last night with you, and and, and I, I felt nervous then, but probably more tonight. I, I don't know, it's probably a combination that I'm, I know other people are going to be listening, and you feel a little bit, you know, on the spot as such. So, well, I don't want you to feel on the spot. Um, like, I, there. <laughs> like I told you, to you, don't feel on the spot. I just hope then, to help somebody, you know, to help them come forward and face things. And it does help, definitely helps in some sort of way. And meeting new people as well. Yes, I know. Well, you know my story. You've listened to it. You know that Vic was oh. who I interviewed with. And... I know when you found me, on um, you become a part of my group on Facebook, and then I, I did. got to hear your story, and then we just got to talking, and then we both talked. I had felt guilty, and it actually called Vic, or yeah, I did call Vic and left him. I think I left him a message, or maybe I sent him a, a Facebook message, and uh, he and I talked though, and I was like, I just feel you know terrible because she's going to interview with me, and he was so wonderful. He was just like, no, no, I'm glad she's going to interview with you and I was like well I think we just you know we made a connection with me being 14 when it happened to me and you were 14 when it happened to you and we both yeah. were so close to it and we saw yeah and I everything. think that's why your your group and fixed group is going to help everybody because there's something comforting about knowing that somebody else knows what you're talking about and you know they've been through it and they know that fear they know the terror of it Oh, the fears are. There's nothing like it. Yeah. Nothing like it. Nothing compares to it. To it. So it's coming together like that. It's surely got to strengthen us all to be able to cope better. Yes, I agree that's with you. That's just another there. reason, really, why I thought, well, I'm not just doing this for me. Others need to know. So that they could, they've probably been living, living with it for many years as well and having to cope with it alone. So bring us together and we can all help each other. That's what life should be like. Well, like I told you, you are definitely not alone. You have me and many, many others, and you are friends now with Vic yourself, and mm -hmm. you know that... Well, I appreciate that. Yes, you know that yeah. we're here, and like I had told you when we decided to do this, and even Vic said it, we don't care if it's... And I'm going to tell everyone, all the listeners, yeah. we don't care if you come to me or Vic or Amanda or Dark Waters. I don't, I don't care who you go to. Whoever you want to tell your story or whoever you want to be interviewed with, 
go to them. Just get your story out there and let others know, like Sharon, that, you know, you're not alone. Um, she's yeah. not alone. I'm not alone. We're all there for each other. We've all been through this and we all know, as Sharon said, the terror and the fear of these things instilling you is unbelievable. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. It's definitely unbelievable. Right. When I was talking to Sharon, I was like, you know, in my encounter, I was just like, my eyes were telling my brain and my brain was fussing with my eyes and my eyes were like, but you see it, it's there, <laughs> you know? Exactly, yeah, well, it's a shock, isn't it? Right, I mean, you, know, you, you believe they're just fictional characters. Right, I mean, and it's and just... seeing one, you just, it's... it's oh, yeah, I mean, it, for it, the majority of us, it is horrifying. Your brain goes so fast, isn't it, processing? Yes, I mean, for the majority of us, when you encounter one of these things, it is so horrifying. And as all the listeners are going to hear, not every story, not every person walks away feeling horrified. I've got some guests that didn't feel that way, and you, all of you will get to hear their stories as well. But the majority of us, we do get that feeling of just dread and horror and fear. And you feel like your life, as I said in my interview, you feel like you're about to die. I mean that that's yeah. you I'm you convinced. know right. in your head yeah. when when we survive this. No way. I got away with everything else before, although I was only fourteen. You know, I'd had many different experiences. Um, one was drowning and other uh, phenomenal things that had happened to me when I was young, but nothing like this. Nothing yeah. At all. But I didn't think I would survive. I really didn't. I know when you, know, you and I, I think shock stayed with me for such a long time because I couldn't believe why I'm not dead. Just couldn't right. believe why it just didn't get me. It was fast enough, big enough, and, you know, like I said, well, I'll, tell it, I'll explain the story as I go along, and people will know, and, but it's just unbelievable, it really is. Yes. Very and hard I, to process. It is, because just like you and I and so many others, we kind of wonder, because you do, when you're in the moment, you think, I'm definitely going to die, and then when you don't yes. die, you're like, Absolutely. okay, why? 100%. Right, you're like, why and didn't I didn't I like die? the thought the way I was going to die either, because I was convinced that was going to eat me to pieces. Yes, I know the feeling. I remember. And then it's like when you survive it and it's over, you're like, okay, well, why, why, why wasn't I killed? Yeah, and that why doesn't stop all your life. No, never, never. No, it's the same as if you see a spirit or you have a UFO encounter. It's the same thing. There's so many whys that we can never get the answers to. Sometimes. No. We're fortunate we, we can get some, but you never get all the answers. No, I... No, I, no, I hear that a lot from all the other experiences I've had, even the spiritual ones. And, but, yeah, um, but you just try your best, and through experience, I believe, you go on to help others. Yes, you know, I... And can give others answers when things are shared. I agree with you there, Sharon. That'd be a good thing, hasn't it? Yes, it has been wonderful. And having the guts to do it. <laughs> yes, and like I said, you, I mean, you told me the other day it already had made you feel better, you know, talking, and I, I told you so many people yeah. I talked to say that, that just talking about it does make you feel better, and it does, especially yeah, when you talk to, right, I, when you I, talk to someone already, who understands. I've to you and they can already feel a connection. Right. I've spoken to a couple of others, just, you know, a little quick, um, one other young lady, I spoke with her for a couple of hours the other evening, can't believe you know, how much is in common between us. And I do believe a lot of these people that have these experiences with these things are more than just um, normal, should we say. I don't like that word. Because <laughs> what is normal? There um, is no normal. <laughs> well, yeah, spiritual people, when I say that, is it caring people or people who have had some sort of encounter with a spirit or a ghost or some phenomena seems very much so in what I've read so far, they all seem to, or what I've listened to, there's some connection which I haven't got my finger on yet because obviously I'm, I'm early days into just seeking and searching and then of course being brave and oh, some, some evenings I'm like, oh, no I can't do it tonight and, and then another night I've challenged it and I've made myself do it. But, you know, it, it, bear, it varies, doesn't it, on on your fear because it's been with you for so long. It's a case of um, talking to yourself and, and saying, yes, you've got to do this. You've got to talk. Yeah. And I think you come to terms with it in the end. Um, and it does already, to me, feel more 
comforting. I feel strong, although I'm still nervous. I'm still wary. Um, but definitely I can feel a lot better than what I did say 11 days ago. Well, I want you to feel strong, and if you need to, you can. I hope I'm going to send some of my energy to you, and hopefully that'll help you get through this. Okay, Sharon, I don't want to hold you up any longer. We've been talking a while, so if you will, and like I said, if you need to stop at any time, we can. But please, let's go ahead, if you're feeling okay, and let's hear this amazing story of yours. Okay. Uh, well, I, I left home and uh, had to walk two miles to get to a place called the Memorial Park in Wickford. Essex, UK. And once I arrived there, um, you have um, a big opening. So you come in off the road and you've got a part of a field where you have to go down a track which leads you to the Memorial Park gates. And that's about two to three hundred yards from the roadside up to the gates itself. And on approaching that that part, I thought I saw my friend Elizabeth at the gates or just go past the gates. But she quickly disappeared, but I took my notice of that and I just, you know, um, picked up my pace a bit and hurried a bit. I had two heavy carrier bags with me with CDs and overnight clothing and all sorts of things in it, which were quite heavy, but I carried on, so I had two to three hundred yards to go. And on approaching the gate, um, she wasn't anywhere to be seen. So I moved inside of the gate, so I am now in the entrance of the park, and stopped and just looked to my left and my right and just looked around. I couldn't see her, so I called her name out and just said, Elizabeth, I know you're here. I saw you. So you might as well come out and stop messing about. I'm not afraid, because you can't scare me if I've already seen you. So let's go. Come on. Out you come. In the meantime, there was this terrific atmosphere um, of, um, you know, nothing unusual for me, being having phenomenal all my life and being part of the spirit world and everything. Um, it, it, I just shrugged it off. I didn't really take any notice of it. I just carried on calling us and stopped messing about. Come on. I know you're there. I heard you. And I heard this rustling sound and... I suppose 50 yards in front of me, um, you have the bridge, and just to the left, you can get down under the bridge, or you have to go through some thickets, of, you know, and bushes, and it leads onto uh, a river, which is called the River Crouch. Um, and on this particular night, it wasn't full, it wasn't had not rained heavy or anything like that, so the water was more like, um, I suppose, a foot-deep stream. I heard a bit of splashing. And I was still calling her at that point, saying, I heard you. And I was had this nervous giggle as well. And then I, it moved to the right-hand side. I heard the splashing almost like somebody had run under the bridge. I didn't think at the time, well, she wouldn't be in the water. She, she wouldn't do that. I just didn't think about that. But anyway, I heard the rustling on the right-hand side of the bridge now, which also you can come up from that side. They had no fencing round. Um... Again, I shouted out, and uh, nothing, and this atmosphere was was becoming stronger and stronger, and there was mist sort of rising off of, off of the embankment, which I just assumed that's probably just where the weather was getting a little bit damp because it had a nice warm day. And then it, it just progressed, this feeling that I, I knew 100 million times that somebody was there. Um, and just kept assuming it was her. So I then assumed, because I heard two lots of sounds from different areas, one um, to the right-hand side and one slightly off behind me, that she brought our other friend, Linda. Um, but obviously she was both nowhere to be seen. So I boldly and confidently started to walk towards the bridge and really getting quite... Ratty, which is annoyed, 
And uh, so I'm like, well, I'm going then. I'm, I'm not waiting any longer. You're obviously messing me about. I'm not afraid. I know it's you. So I'm just going to go. I'm bored now, listening, um, not listening, but waiting for you to appear and try and think you're going to jump out on me. You know, I was a verbal with it, really quite verbal. All the time this feeling was creeping nearer and I was shrugging it off constantly. I thought maybe maybe I was just in the dark. Although there was a light on the bridge, so it gave quite a bit of lighting. So, you know, I could see where I was going. Um, and I would have seen if somebody was in the bushes. But there was nothing at that point until... I then started to, when I started to walk the 50 yards to the beginning of the bridge, I felt something come up behind me. I didn't turn around because I, I expected her to just go boo. But then this was a heavy slapping, like you could hear somebody was walking and just about, I felt, to jump on me. Um, I heard a very heavy footing and I just stopped then at that point of the bridge. And I felt like, um, not quite paralyzed, but just I knew that sense of fear I'd known before, but this was ten times stronger. And I was too afraid to turn around and look, because I knew that wasn't Elizabeth's footprints, or footsteps, should I say, that I could hear, because they were too heavy. So I was analyzing, my brain was going really, really fast, and analyzing. And then, of course, this horrific growl, oh, it, which was a real throttly rumble that shook my heart and shook out my soul inside me. Almost like I'd totally been petrified just by the noise and I knew it wasn't her then. But it, it sort of came from up behind me and, and I could feel... Well, I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but it, it sort of caught my hair, so I knew there was a vibration there. And I knew then it had stopped because the footstep had stopped, and I knew it was right on me, behind me. And that's when I had to turn around to look, just to convince myself it wasn't Elizabeth. Um, even though I didn't believe it at that time, obviously, because the, the feeling and the atmosphere was so... So mega strong. Um, never felt anything like that. But I, anyway, I turned around, and I only went halfway round, and there it was, its face, and it was four to five inches in front of me. It was in my face. And I just froze, um, and I actually wet myself on the spot. It's a bit embarrassing to say, but I did. And there it was, a, a dog face. Um, showing and, and growling its teeth at me and its breath hitting my face. And uh, I noticed um, tiny little details, but obviously you've got to remember that when you're in shock, if, if anybody's ever experienced this, your brain processes a million things instead of just one thing. And it was processing every single detail while my eyes were popping out of my head peeing myself at the same time and thinking, that's it, I'm going to die, this thing is going to eat me. We were looking at a giant wolf, um, and it wasn't a cute wolf. I love wolves. This was not a wolf, it was a werewolf. I hate the word. Even the word makes me feel extremely shaky inside, just saying that I much prefer the name Dogman. Um, it doesn't affect me where the other name does. Um, anyway... Huge teeth, fangs, and I noticed um, slight bits of flesh hanging off of its gums. It was brown in colour, um, quite this fur, fur, if you call it fur, hair. I'd said hair, I suppose like a bear. Or a wolf, yeah, like that. Um, it was very dark brown with bits of black in it, so it was a bit of a mixture but more brown. And his eyes, um, they were like a... So, I hate this bit. <laughs> yeah. The eyes were orange and red. Sorry, I've got to stop. Okay, we'll be right back, folks. It's okay, Sharon, it's fine. 
everybody we're back um sharon had to take a little bit of a break and i hope everyone will just bear with her please everyone remember this is very hard for her it's very hard for a lot of us to go back into our memories and to remember this because as i said for most of us this is very very frightening it's very traumatic so please just bear with her and let's all just rally around Sharon as she finishes telling us this story. Sharon, go ahead. Okay, now, continuing to view the face, when I reached the eyes, as I said, they were orange-red, a real deep orange. But to look into them, it was just full of, you know, the most powerful rage ever imaginable. And obviously continuing its growl and, and the aura as well itself was just, sheer terror. Um, I've never experienced anything like it in my entire life or even heard of such terror. You watch films on TV, but you, you just, until you've got the sense of that real terror, you, you know, it's obviously unimaginable. Now, what I noticed was, while it was angry, the creasing of its brow, which had hair on, and but the, the actual eyelids itself were almost, almost bored. Um, just bits and pieces of uh, the dark, darkish hair rather than the brown on that bit. Um, but the face looked quite leathery. When I say the face, not the entire face, but more so the nose itself and just the eyebrows. They leaned over heavily, the eyebrows, so as it was growling, it was like, very chunky there. I suppose how you'd see, I don't know, an ape or something like that, but obviously it didn't look like an ape. Coming back to the nose, that was almost bald, so, and it looked shiny, but then it would be if it had been in the water, so because there was parts of it, it was quite wet, and obviously it's probably why I heard its feet slapping rather than thumping um, when it was just coming after me. Going down the neck, I noticed behind its head, obviously it was, I saw its ears and they were pointed, um, not as big um, what I thought they were, but they were smaller than, I suppose, how you'd see a very, very enlarged Alsatian. They were a similar style, just very pointed, and again, you could see the, I say it's leathery, because it looked leathery, almost shiny, like, you know, not, but not shiny, shiny, like polished, but just like skin when wet. Um, coming away from the face, which was full of hair. Um, I had a black nose, by the way. Um, the neck was thick. Um, the head was huge. I mean, extremely huge. Probably, if you look at a German shepherd dog, probably three to four size, double that. And then the shoulders was protruding. So, like I've heard other people explain, and like, I totally understand it. A big muscle builder. Um, I suppose like the Hulk, that's what that part reminds me of now. If I see the Hulk's shoulders, then I think, yeah, you put a few hairs on that and you'd see that. But the unusual thing was I saw was the hump it had on, on it, the back of its neck that so made it look even more muscular. Um, and it had that same stance like the muscle builders do when they clench, you know, just with the shoulders stooped down. The arm was full of hair, but the interesting thing was its, its hands. It didn't have paws. It had hands. Fingers were really long. And it was close enough for me to, to, to see. I couldn't see, obviously, the left side because my head... His face was so close to mine, I had to turn my face to the left side and then just swing my eyes down with as much force as possible because I needed to know what I was looking at. I was not convinced, I suppose, at that point that this was real at all. But following the body down, it's full of hair. It was, um, I'll tell you the bizarre thing about it in a minute, but I'll continue first. The hands were, the, the fingers were extremely long, and the claws were, I'd say, half human, like coloured like human, but too dirty to be, um, like, full of mud and just stained very stained and just filthy dirty. Um, 
they were when you see the claws on some of these pictures, they're extremely long. And the one I see, it, it was nowhere near like that. I suppose I'm looking at about three quarters of an inch, maybe an inch long. And so it was a proper hand, and with hair running on the top of the fingers. Now coming down the body, I couldn't see all the body, but the the chest was exposed, and that again was similar to the nose. It was quite bald around the top of the chest, very muscular. And I'll say muscular, just ripples of muscle everywhere. A little bit of a shine to the chest again, so that you knew that you were seeing the skin of it. I was going down, but I couldn't really see it below the waist or anything like that, other than. I'm going to tell, I may as well tell you now so that I haven't got to keep sort of stopping and starting. But the bizarre thing about this thing, it had a check shirt on, a sleeveless check shirt. And it had a, a tanned pair of trousers on. But the clothes look ancient, filthy, bloodied, dirtied, um, like if you picked up something that had been laying in the mud and it had been there a hundred years maybe, it was so, so shredded with holes and it was literally hanging off of it because it had no sleeves. Um, and I could make out, it was like, it was once originally a blue check shirt. That sounds crazy. No. But that's, that's what I saw. And then, then I, and it was, um, one of the buttons actually was done up and that was near to the waist, but I couldn't see below the waist because the trousers were then covering it. I couldn't see the top to it of its thighs, but then I went down the legs and you could see the outline of the legs was just exactly like a dog's leg, other than the feet were absolutely huge and they also looked human with slight claws rather than nails. And again, partial hair on the tops of the feet. And... Um, now, do you remember if the leg was canine, Sharon? Was it a canine leg with the inverted Canine, knee, yes, or? definitely. Not men's legs at all. It's okay. a canine because it's slightly, um, from the side, it went forward and then it went down again. But then it went just, just like a dog's leg, but enlarged. You know, I mean, this thing, I mean, I'm, I was about four foot ten at that point in, in that, in nine, because this was 1975. So I was about 4 foot 10, maybe 11, I don't know, around that size. Now I had to look up when, when its face came at me. I was looking up, so it wasn't, I was look, not looking straight forward at it. So I had to put my head up because of the size of it. And I can only estimate probably about 6 foot, 6, 6 foot 8, but I can't be certain. I just know it was huge. I was more really trying to capture the details to try and convince myself that this was not real, what I was seeing. But because everything was moving on it, the hands and the growl and feeling the breath, and it absolutely stunk, by the way. The hot breath I smelt was tinged with like a blood smell, metallic, or, you know, like metally. Now, I have, you know, I have human blood smells, but it, it, it smelled like, I've smelled dead animals before, you know, when, when, when you, you've got maggots on them and it absolutely is a stench and it takes your breath away. And I could smell that. It, it, it was awful smell. But, I mean, the main fear for me was the aura that it was, and the, the atmosphere it was pushing into me. I felt like, and in that second, it was ripping my soul out. Literally, it become painful. Um, I suppose because I thought that if, if I'd experienced that now, I'm sure I would have just died of a heart attack, basically, or I certainly would have passed out. But my reaction was just paralysis, really, just paralysed, and the only thing I could move was just slightly my head to look down at it, and you know to take it all in. I didn't notice a towel. Maybe it was tucked in its trousers. Now I'm being a bit humorous there. Try and break my nervousness up, but I don't remember seeing a towel. I think I must have had one if it looked like a dog, yeah? But anyway, at that point, I knew I had to run for my life, or I was just about, within those seconds, I was just about, that thing was going to rip me to pieces, and I knew it. It was oozing, but I'm going to eat you, and that is it. And, and that's all I could feel from it was, I'm dead. 
I'm not going to survive this. So I, with all my might, I prized my hands open with my mind to release the bags I was holding because I was still hanging on to them. With fear, my hands had locked. So I was just totally locked in paralysis with that actual fear of it, and it, you know, growling constantly in my face. Um, and again, this was like, this was all happening in seconds. I don't, I, I don't think it was even a minute. It could have been, I don't know. I, I no concept of time during that time. All I know that I was processing a hell of a lot. But I managed to just open my hands and I knew once I dropped them, I could run. And, and I do remember when I dropped, its face looked down on the floor. That moment, I run for my life across that bridge. But I still knew that I was going to die. That's what I thought. The whole run. Now, that run from that bridge, I had to go up a slight hill because it's like an embankment, what I, I, I prefer to say, and run across this very short field into the alleyway to get to my friend's house. And in hope as well, she was on her way, that she was, you know... Somehow, as I was running, I was hoping, I was thinking, I was hoping that she would just come from the alleyway and she'd see me running. Obviously, I was screaming my head off. I, I don't think I took one breath. I just held my breath with fear, screaming the whole time. That's all I remember is my voice. And it was just, yeah, it, it was awful. On that run, now that thing could have at me there on the bridge. It could have got me at any time on that run because it chased me and stayed right on my back and I could feel it and it was still growling and I was constantly also thinking any minute it's just going to take the back of my neck and I could feel this heaviness where I was almost hunched as I was running. I know that sounds a bit weird to say but I was so tensed up. And then as I hit the alleyway, obviously I I don't know, I, I, I was convinced I run, it, I run fast enough. But I know that not to be the case as I, as I got older and I analysed. I thought, there's no way I would have escaped that. That thing let me go. It let me go. Okay. And that's the hardest thing I've had to live with. Is knowing why didn't it eat me? Why would it do? Why just didn't it do what, it, what I thought it was going to do? It's left me with that total fear and um, feeling that it hasn't finished with me and that's how I felt basically but anyway I, I run still screaming through the alleyway now another thing I thought about was that should have chased me through the alley because it was all overgrown the alley that bushes on either side it nobody could have seen me run for it if it got me in the alley nobody would have even witnessed that I was in there unless of course somebody was about which nobody was and um, I ran to the house, and I was smashing, the, trying to smash the door down, screaming, help me, and I fell to the floor, and as um, my son Elizabeth's dad opened the door, and of course he said, oh my God, you know, whatever's happened, and I was telling him, there's a werewolf, there's a werewolf after me, and please let me in, don't shut the door, shut the door. I was so afraid and so petrified, literally. But um, Bill, his name was, um, my friend's dad's name was Bill, and he couldn't calm me down, and the mother couldn't calm me down, which, and Elizabeth couldn't calm me down, and, and I'm screaming at her, why weren't you there, why weren't you there, and, and I could hear, it. although I could hear her talking to me, I couldn't, my brain and my ears couldn't bypass the sounds that travelled with me of that growl. It continued even while I was in that house, almost like it had deafened me, and I could just barely make her voice out and her dad's, but when he said, right, I'm going to go and investigate, because obviously, you know, Elizabeth said, where's your bags, and I said, I, I dropped them, they're there still, um, I had to run, blah, 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 and her dad then said, I'm going to investigate, and then I was grabbing hold of him, saying, please don't go, he'll kill you, he'll kill you. So you can imagine, you know, really what that was like. Um, seen it in the movies, I suppose, you know, you can see that sort of thing happening. But he did go, he left, and I was just 
hysterical in the meantime. Uh, the doctor had been called before he left. He'd phoned the doctor to get somebody to come out to me, and um, which I think, I don't know how long that was. I had no concept of the time or anything. Uh, it, it couldn't have been that long because he'd gone. He came back with my bag. And his words were to his wife, because I heard them. I don't think he was actually directed at me, but because I was still being hysterical and screaming and crying. And, um, but he he said the bags were just there exactly where she left them, but he said, he said it made me shiver down there. He, he said it was just this awful atmosphere. He said, no, I couldn't get back quick enough. And now that we're talking, he's six foot four. He was a big man. He wasn't afraid of anything. You know, um, but for him to say that, it's always stuck in my, my memory of having that very subtle whisper that I heard him say. Because I was in the li living room um, trying to be calmed down by Elizabeth and being held down and you know, trying to calm me while they were discussing that sort of between the hallway and the kitchen. And then the doctor arrived and um, that, he uh, poked me up the bottom with his uh, needle. I'm uh, trying to be humorous about that, but there's nothing funny about this really at all. But yeah, and um, it was from then. Um, things didn't get any better because I had ter terrible nightmares. Where I had no sleeping and I was months and months with the doctor. And, and I had tried hypnotherapy and couldn't get into it. I was too afraid. I've always been afraid to talk about it or even mention the word. Um, that does continue, really, to this day, although I'm a lot stronger now than what I used to be. But it's taken me all these years, and it only 11 days ago, to open, 11 days ago, to open up about it. And um, I'm really doing that because I look at it, I'm 54, I've faced all my other fears, and I have had horrendous um, encounters of um, other worlds and, and, and things like that, but I've dealt with it. Nothing. Nothing compares to this thing, nothing. I could face anything other than this thing again. It's just what it leaves you with. And, yeah, it's absolute terror. Um, can't describe, in fact, words fail me to describe that terror. And I still don't understand to this day why it allowed me to go. That could have killed me any time. There and then, and it didn't. So that's what makes me wonder if there's more to these things, more intelligence than just some ordinary dog or a wolf. I think it thinks at times like a human because when I had the eye contact with it, I felt something from it like it knew more like a human. But you knew it wasn't obviously a human. You knew it was some sort of beast. For many years, I put it down to it was just a very, very... I, 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 I suppose I thought it was the devil. You know, I suppose. Um, not 100% and not always, but every now and again I've just tried to, to remove the fear. I've just shrugged it off and said, yeah, it's just something very devilish. But thinking about it now, I know it wasn't devilish because this was real. I saw every part of that thing move. And I forgot to mention as well that it drooled. It was drooling as it was growling at me, and the drool was just dripping off of its bottom jaw. And every time it growled, a couple of times, I think it was, little splashes of that drool hit my face. And, you know, and it's a hot breath. And, of course, the doctor in the hospital for many, many years said, mass hallucination. And I've argued with that because hallucinations, you cannot feel warmth, wet. You don't hear that. You don't feel that. None of those things describe an hallucination. I know that was real. I know. You know, and um, I'm not easily convinced about anything. I analyse and rip everything apart without seeing that. It's just horrendous, absolutely horrendous. And, and knowing just recently that there are other people out there experiencing this frightens the hell out of me. And I fear for them, and I fear for their lives. And look, honestly, people, please don't look for them. They are highly dangerous 
And just because I survived and other people are surviving doesn't mean to say you will. They choose their victims, and I am sure as well. That must have fed that night because of the blood I smelt. I saw that, what I thought looked like flesh hanging off his gum. And I think I interrupted a feeding or something like that at that time. Wrong time, wrong moment. I shouldn't have been there perhaps, you know, but that was it. And the reason why my friend Elizabeth wasn't there was because she was running late, 20, 25 minutes late. So I found out after. Well, I think no. you're very brave for coming forward, and I agree with you. No one should ever go out looking for these things. They are very it's dangerous. No. no. And I can't emphasize that enough. They are dangerous. And if you think you've got a gun that's big enough to stop these things, think again. You will not get away. They are too fast. Before you get that gun out, that would have ripped you to pieces. If it chooses to do that to you, well, you, you're lucky, son, and they let you go. You're right there. Too many people have already tried to shoot them. It never does them any good. If anything, it just angers the creature. Oh, yeah. So I don't know how you would ever kill these things. Neither do I. I do believe that the military are totally aware of these things. And the government, they, I'm, sure, I'm convinced they know, and they cover them up. A lot of people... About all the missing people from the world, you know, and they're never found. And these things are out there. You know, and just in 11 days of me just, you know, joining you, Danielle, and, and, and say, I, I just cannot believe how many people are experiencing them. And I never even knew there was people in the UK because I've been too scared to even research it. I can't even face looking at these things. But since being with you, I've, you know, I am now slowly scrolling down. If I think one looks like mine, I can't look at it. But I'm really, really trying hard to face this. And I think I will succeed, like I have succeeded with all my other things and experiences of my life. I have got to do this. It's a challenge. The biggest one I've never wanted to face. And um, obviously the nightmares, I'll contend with them. Um, but I have a lot less of them. Like I said, a lot of them stopped. By the time I got to the age of 37, that's when they actually stopped. I was having two or three of them a week up until the age of 37. And I don't know why they just stopped. It was um, perhaps the circumstances or my mindset, I don't know. But I only get them every now and again now. And now I clean up, so they're back. And um, you start getting them again. And I've, you know, I've got to a point when the dark comes here. I know it's, this is paranoia. I know the difference. I can't even look out the kitchen window in case I'm drawing it back because that energy it gave me made me feel you are more than just an animal. Now, what gets me every time is listening to these stories that they silence everything. The insects, the birds. What does that? It's not an animal on our earth that can silence insects and do that. So what does it carry with it? Obviously, some sort of energy that's so powerful, so in rage, and just want, you know, just be a killer, killer. The worst we have on our planet to shut the insects up and the birds, that's got to be some powerful beast. So if you think a gun is going to stop them, I think think powerful things. And so many people... very muscular. And so many people's yeah. stories, it is yeah. reported, you know, Sharon, it's, that everything is quiet. It was in my story, and I can't, I mean, there's so many stories. It's just countless where everything goes quiet. And that yeah. is a sign of a, a predator, a big predator being around. You know, even um, me coming from a hunting family and the fact that I hunted, and I know so many hunters, when there's something very large, like a bear or a cougar or, you know, a wolf, something huge, a lot of times everything does go still. And it's like they know that there's something out there that is not good. <laughs> yeah, it just goes to show that all our souls on this earth, we sensitize to things like that, an energy of some sort. Yes, it's like almost like the... Uh, it's almost like a grim reaper. It's like everything knows yes. death is calling. Yes. It, it's very yeah. odd. It is. It's like you know, a, a death call. Pieces. 
tells you you're going to die. It's literally telling you. Yes, it does. Your time's up and you're going to die the nastiest possible way. Let me rip you to pieces. That's what it's telling you with its eyes. Let me ask you this, Sharon. You would said you'd heard too. Do you do you think there might have been another one that you didn't see with hearing something behind you? Maybe because I did hear two lots, and that's why I assumed um, my friend Elizabeth had bought her other friend, which is my friend as well, Linda. I thought maybe because obviously it was getting dark, maybe she wanted a, a chaperone to come with her. So, but I never saw the other one, if right. there was the other one. But, you know, it's possible that I did hear, I was hearing two and not just that one. Now, I want you, because even I was shocked, please tell the listeners, because, you know, I had told you, I thought you were like, I knew you were close, but I thought you were like two, three feet away. Tell no. everyone just how close this thing was. Well, four to five inches, it was in my face. Wow. It's nose, and it's... I suppose the end of its nose was no more than four inches and it was coming towards my right side of my cheek even though I had to run towards the right hand side towards the bridge so I didn't know and that's when I was on the left because I pushed my head back to look up with its nose nearly touching my right side of my cheek but it's just this mouth roaring at me you know so I had bird's eye view of the teeth and the gums lifting, the creases in its face, the eye movement, blink, even the brow. I've got a thing about them eyes, it's just they frighten the hell out of me. And the brow was so thick and heavy over its eye. You know, you see a lot of your pictures um, of the, these, the dog men, and they look too much like a wolf. And this thing was more than just a wolf. This was a beast. A werewolf. It was definitely a werewolf with a long nose. Now, do you do yeah. you believe that it had any human qualities to you? Yes, I felt that it did because of its hands and its feet were like very enlarged human feet, but with obviously the claw. Obviously, it doesn't do toenail cutting. So yeah, there was a slight. Um, okay, I'm trying to. You know, a gorilla. Yes. You know a gorilla's nails? They're quite... It, it's sort of curved, don't they? Yes. Can you imagine a gorilla's finger, you know, his, his finger claw itself? But longer than that and more pointed. Like, these were sharp. You know, these could rip me to pieces. But they wasn't... It, it, the colour's very hard to distinguish. I noticed them so well, but I, I mean, I can see it right this minute now in my head. Even, you know, the cuticle on, on its claw fingers was just filled with mud. Just filthy, dirty, and it's just like it just got out of that water or just it's been digging or something. But it's, you know, I mean, like I say, the, the clothes as well, they were just rags. Well, Sharon, what do you make, out. What do you make of it yeah, having clothes on? You know, made me think and try to laugh about it, it had clothes on, come on, maybe showing you were having an hallucination, that's what I used to say to myself, when, you know, when I was young. But what do you think about that, no, because it's real. I have, I, I want, I'm going to run this by you, Sharon, do you think that this thing, and this is going to sound crazy, do you think it could no, have no, gotten, no. do you think it could have gotten the clothes from <sighs> grave robbing? I don't know. I, I will tell you though. It's just so it odd, was you know. To attack me, um, just behind it, where it actually ended up coming from. Well, I assume that's where it came from, because as I walked to the bridge, I felt first of all I said it was over to the left. Then I heard something run under the bridge. Then over to the right. But at the same time, something far to the right. Like you said, that's when I thought maybe Linda was about as well hiding in there and Elizabeth was under the bridge. But right behind me, that's where I thought it was coming up. But if I'm looking at it, as I started to walk to the bridge, there is a little tiny alley to the left, which even my friends, when we were very young kids, we used to, every 
now and again go to this end of the park and we'd go fishing and try and get newts and frogs and stuff like that from the river if it was shallow. Um, but we never would go through that entrance because it was so covered over and we used to get worried in case there was some dirty old stalker or something like that down there. So it was laughable in them days, but, you know, we, we, we used to try and keep ourselves safe in no matter what. But it could have come from that particular alley, originally, I'm saying. And if you follow that alley, 800 to 900 yards through that alley, all the under the undergrowth bush, it leads onto people's and the churchyard, that garden. So there is a church up there, and apparently that church is well known for spirit activity, hmm. um, where apparently there's, there's a story, there's a true story that there's a book out about it as well. It's called the Runwell Church. You can Google it and you can, you know, find out about what used to go on there apparently many years ago, witches were doing their bits and pieces there, and the devil apparently showed itself to the priest and scratched the door, and oh. the markings on the door are still there. And it became back, I think, in the 70s or the 80s, newspaper people wanted the story about it, and the priest was not, he didn't want to talk about it. I don't know whether he's still alive. I really don't know, but he would refuse to talk or tell his story. And to stop the photographers coming round to the church, he, he turned the door around the other way. And so that nobody can see the claw on the inside of the church, they put a curtain over it. But that's a story, you know, of somebody years ago, and I don't think a priest would lie about it. Right. But that again, is... apparently the devil showed itself to him. Now, say that again. How do you pronounce that? Because I would love to Google that. Run word. R-U-N, as in run. W-E-L-L. Run well. Okay. Run word. All right. Run well church. All right. I'll have to look Net that up. Wickford. Just for myself. I'd just like to read about it. That That's interesting. Yeah, you'll find it. People have written books on it about the stories. I can't say I've... I only know that much about it. I've never really looked into it too much because anywhere near that memorial park, I don't want to know because of my encounter. Oh, I don't blame you. I don't want to know. It scares me. And I'm still only living three, three and a half, four miles away from it. Oh, I didn't know that, so, Sharon. Well, too close for me. <laughs> I'm thinking about emigrating to Canada. <laughs> I had no so, idea you were that close still. Wow. No wonder you're having such a hard time still. Yeah, even now, you know, all these years later, I'll go da daylight past that place in the car and I'll take the dogs down. I can't go there during the day without somebody being with me. And even then, it just takes me a hell of a lot to get through that gate because I just keep thinking it's still there. And I, I, and I just talk myself through it, saying, oh, come on, Sharon, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to just, um, I nurture myself all the time and I know I've got to face these things but you will never get me down there once that dark comes and I know these things are seen during the day but my experience was dark so I associate it with that timing and with that I, I cannot do it I right. will not do it because I just feel maybe it's still there or it's, it, it, it's around or something I, I don't know I just I, I, I probably that paranoia because of the fear that I encountered, and I, you know, I don't know. I haven't got the answer. I just know stay away from there, and I stay away. But all the years I have to, because when I go shopping, I have to go past that place in, in the car, and I just shudder every time I have to pass it, even in the car, every time I go shopping. Well, I'm going to ask you, because I ask all my guests, although to me it's very apparent, how has this changed your life, Sharon? I think it's held me back because it gave me a fear. Okay, there's two ways you can look at it. The fear was so powerful, it did change everything about me. It, it taught me things about humans, that they're all ignorant, and they're no good at listening to anybody. They just want to put down a story like that, that it's everything else but that story. Now, if anybody interviewed me or, or knew me, they would see I was telling the truth. 
and they would see my fear and they would, you know, they would just know. But nobody ever wanted to listen. They don't want to know. Maybe it's because they're afraid. But where it changed my life was the continuous nightmares and the fear. And it, that fear has kept me trapped and wary to go to certain places, certain times. Like I won't enter woods because I know that it could not, it might not just be this place here. Of course, I, as I know now, it's not. Um, it, they're all over the place. Um, every country, you know, well, well, not every country, I suppose, but I don't know. I should ask you that question because I don't really know. I'm still obviously researching. Well, from yes. what I hear, yes, every country, there has been sightings. Every one. Yeah, what, yeah. well, what's the shame about well, this? Well, I haven't heard in Antarctica yet. We can't but. talk, and nobody wants to hear or listen to it. There's no help. Um, I, I just find humans ignorant... Um, you know, if, if I've been able to have perhaps somebody listened to me years ago, I might not have had to have put up with all these nightmares. I could have maybe somehow been comforted enough to be strong enough to to know I'm not alone. It made me alone and isolated. But it changed my world more so. I mean, of course, I had, I mean, I've spoke to spirit all my life. That changed me anyway um, from being ever too normal, the so-called normal. I always knew I was different. Um, I think it just made me more aware that it's not just spirit. There are dark, dark things on this earth and things unbelievable and through the years made me think, where do all these people get these film stories from, the werewolf? Um, you know, um, I'm trying to think now. You know, there's all these horror things. Of course, they're experiments, and they are real things. But what our government decide not to tell us. Well, I suppose if everybody was scared, you tell me what would happen if you, if if the government announced, or anybody announced that there are werewolves all over the world, what would people do? Mass hysteria. Oh, be... hold on, the government's saying this. Yeah, it would be mass hysteria. To that. It would be it would be awful. Yeah, wouldn't that be frightened of going out in the dark? What do you think? It would be mass hysteria. I, I mean, everyone. Really? So they've hushed it all up, and I think on the quiet, people do go missing, people are eaten, but it's covered up just to stop that mass hysteria. I believe that too. I believe a lot. And I'm not. On it. And, 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 and logic tells me that. I'm, I'm not quite a logical person. I'm not one of these, you know. Mediums as well, that if the light bulb flickers, oh, it must be a ghost. No, I'm not like that. I need hard evidence, and I've always, you know, lived like that because I need the truth. And growing up, I found it hard knowing the difference between what a ghost and a human was. They all look the same to me. Um, until I learned and I grew from a very young age, knowing the difference, and gradually it was, you know, a learning process. But I really don't have any answers for these werewolves other than. Stay away, look for them, because they are out there. Just how many, I don't know, but it's frightened me just knowing, recently finding that information out, oh my God, just how many people are encountering these things. Well, I just heard a story, uh, which this will not make you feel any better, but there is undoubtedly a breeding population. There's been stories now of what we believe mothers yeah, they must with, be their, with their cubs someone reported seeing one in a field somewhere playing. Of course, they had no fear. They just watched them play, but I don't believe they noticed them either. But undoubtedly, they are breeding, and there is a population of I them. I think there's more danger if there was a pack. You know, like, I saw one. There may have been two. I don't know. I have no evidence of that. But I think it could have been a different matter if it was a pack, and they were all hungry. And I don't think I would be here today. And I could have easily have gone missing. There was nobody about. Nobody. You know, um, I suppose if I was late, turning up at Elizabeth, she may have thought, well, because we couldn't have phones. I didn't have a phone. She didn't have a phone in them days. You know, phones, home phones were a bit, oh, you know, 
couldn't afford it one way or another or they just didn't want them. My mother just certainly wouldn't have one. Um, so that was a bit, you know, you couldn't contact like that. It was, you walked to that person's house if you needed to ask them to come out and you took that chance because it was two or three miles away. You walked all that way to see if they're in and they're not in. So she may have just thought, oh, I'm not turning up or my mother may not have let me or they could have been a, you know, I could have just gone missing. And no tracks maybe would have ever been found of me. Well, and I told you, Sharon, the interviews I've been doing, I believe, I'm beginning to believe that a lot of us survive because it does seem like the people that survive, not unless they just see one crossing the road, but I mean, people who have really close encounters like yeah. you and yeah. me and other witnesses, it seems like they did just feed. And I wonder if that is why we survive. I wonder. And, you know, we can keep wondering, but we're never going to know. No. The more you know about them, the more questions you have. It it drives me insane. It really yeah, does. Well, I'm used to that with the UFO thing. I've always got, you you know, questions and, and things like that. And all that. So that's another story. But, yeah, I'm the same now. I question everything. And I, I suggest everybody does that. Question everything you hear, everything you see. Because there is nothing really real in this world. And the most thing that is real is what you feel, not what you see with your eyes. There's so many, there's so many lies out there and so many cover-ups of everything. You know, don't think you're mad. Investigate it, you know. Feel your way through it. Question, you know, even if you have to write it down, question all the positives and the negatives about any encounter you have or any bad thing. Just write it a list. Ask yourself questions, and occasionally you will get answers, but you certainly will answer whether you're mad or not. Like me, I question everything to find out what... Did I, did I have an hallucination? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I know that a million times. Well, I know you yeah. didn't have I a hallucination. I think the doctor knew that in the end, after keep seeing him week after week. You know, although he listened. I, I gave him too many details. And I made him quiet. He went quiet at the end. He said, I don't know what else to say, but just he just said, keep taking the tablets. And the moment he said that to me, I stopped taking them. <laughs> because I knew that's madness. I need to take a grip with this and deal with things without any tablet help. But I took them, I think it was about, oh, I don't know, two or three weeks. Because I was in such shock and I was a terrible mess. I'm a fighter me anyway, I just, you know, I'm a survivor, I just, I don't believe in giving up easily, you know, I, I will not be beaten down by anything that doesn't belong in this world, or if it does belong, I'm a fighter in other ways, where I think I demand to know some truth, I need truth, I live it, my middle name, I need it, I breathe it, and any of my, any person that knows me will tell you the same thing. Well, I do not think that you are crazy, and I know it was not a mass oh, I know hallucination. I'm not. I know right. you're not. It wasn't a mass else. hallucination that you had. You actually encountered this. Yeah. And Sharon, we're nearing the end. If you could send a message to everyone, what would it be about your encounter? Oh, quite simply, do not go and find them. They will attack you. And if you think you're strong enough, no matter what gun you've got, they will take you down unless they choose not to. But be afraid of them because they are something to really fear, really fear. They are monsters, real monsters. Well, it sounds crazy, but they are real monsters. No gun will protect you. They're not quick enough. They're too fast. I think, uh, I'm sorry to say it, but they'd slice you up before you could take your gun out. You might think you're ready. You might think you're brave enough. You know, it, that, that to me is a very silly person if you're going to find them. I think so too. You don't, you definitely do and, not you know, need yeah, to look for them. Can give. Be talking people because <laughs> it is a comfort. Yes, it is I a comfort. I think it is anyway. <laughs> I didn't have a nightmare last night. So something's happening. Well, you know, good. As much as I've been talking about tonight, I don't know. I'm going to try and think positive that no, I'm not going to have a nightmare tonight, but I can't be sure. 
assured of that. Oh. I will keep trotting on now. I've started my, you know, just standing up to it. And um, it's about time. Too many years have gone by. Well, I think you're very brave, Sharon. You're very courageous, and I want to. I think all you are as well. You've all, you know. Oh, well, thank, thank you, you so you. much. I'm so glad you're all out there. That that helps me be strong. You know, we're all doing something together. We all have that in common. Help each other. One way, whether it's a little message to each other. Yes, and yeah. you know, if you yeah. ever need me, I'm right here. You can call me, send me a email, and I'll call you. I'm here for you. I am. I am for you also. Well, thank you. Uh, if I can be. <laughs> <Of course>. <laughs> well, <laughs> I just want to thank you for coming on the show and for telling your story because I know how hard it was for you. But know that we all appreciate it very much, and I'm sure that people are going to, you know, be talking about the story for quite a while. Sharon, if you'll hold on, I'm just going to close the show out. I want to thank you again, Sharon. For coming on Dogman Diaries and for telling your story. I know that I and the listeners really appreciate you doing that. And know that we also support you. And that if you need to contact me, please do. As always, if you have a Dogman story or you know of a friend or a family member that has a story, then please contact me. Attention, Danielle, I have a Dogman story at dogmandiaries at gmail.com or on Facebook at Dogman Diaries. Here at Dogman Diaries, we will never judge you or your story. I'm a believer because I'm also a survivor too. And remember, if you're like me and people inquire why you're so afraid of the dark, simply reply, I'm not afraid of the dark. I'm afraid of what could be lurking in the dark. Have a great weekend, friends. Until next time, be safe and be blessed. My thoughts and prayers are with you all. Good night.